I have given them to I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of this world any more than I am of the world my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one they are not of the world even as I am not of it sanctify them by the truth your word is truth as you send me into the world I have sent them into the world for them I sanctified myself that they too may be truly sanctified so be it Good to see you. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for this warm place that we can come and worship you. We thank you for the snow. We thank you for the sun, the rain. Lord, we just thank you that you give your blessings upon the righteous and the unrighteous. And Father, remind us that there are none righteous, no, not one, except because of the blood of Jesus Christ. May we hear your words today, and may we, as we start out this new year, Ponder and think about the blessings that you give us more often and the life that we have so that we can bring glory and honor to you with as much of the life that you've given us as possible. We do thank you that we're not being persecuted or driven from our homes, Lord. And at that same time, help us to realize that we have even more of an opportunity to, to preach the gospel without persecution. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for those who preach the gospel even when they have persecution, not just the first church, but those that are in the world today that are being persecuted. Lord, we pray for boldness to preach your word. Father, give us safe travel when we travel to and from and just open our eyes and ears and hearts to hear your words and apply them to our lives so that we can bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I entitled this Occupant. And you're like, what in the world does that mean? I, I don't know reason I don't know is because when I write the sermons, I have all these notes and things, and I have stuff that I carry over from the old sermons, and I open up last week's sermon and look, and there's a page after the sermon before there's a bunch of notes, and there's just this word occupant, and I don't remember why that's there <laughs> or anything, and I had no real direction on where I was going with this because of some things happening if we got the kids if you didn't know and we didn't even know we had the kids till they're on the door <laughs> so I was in disarray of where I was going with the sermon and I, I've got this occupant in front of me so when I finally sat down to start writing Jesus he was an occupant in this world Stephen was an occupant in this world they lived as foreigners Maybe they knew the time they had. Maybe they didn't know the time they had. I mean, Jesus knew when he was on the way to the cross. I don't know if he knew exactly this time span that it would carry or anything else. He knew from Scripture that his time hadn't come. And then he knew that from Scripture that his time had now come. But he lived his life with God's purpose in mind. Because the only reason that we have life the breath that we have, the existence that we have, is because God willed it and brought it to being. And sometimes we get caught up in all the things that God did create for us to enjoy, and we tend to worship them more than we worship Him. And we tend to not thank Him. And that's where I want to head this, this year to start off. Occupant, that's who I am. And I was given new life once I came to that understanding of what God had done for me through Jesus Christ. And I, and I read the scriptures and I study the scriptures and I see that I, that, that I am not righteous. There were so many times that I want to think I'm more righteous than someone else. And my righteousness that I think I have is of filthy rags. But I am righteous because of the blood of Jesus. So how can I be more like Jesus in this world? 
And we have that example of Stephen who was like Jesus until he did breathe his last. His last breaths were to forgive those who were persecuting and killing him. He didn't understand why or anything else. And we're going to look at, at the beginning of Acts chapter 8 and see that the persecution drove them out into Judea and Samaria. Now, here's where I struggle. Maybe you don't as I, as I study those things. I'm not being persecuted. I'm not being driven from my home. So how do I live as Christ in the world today? How do we live as a church? And Kim said it before when she was up here, we do with what we have now, but we make sure that we take everything that we have and use it for the glory of God. We don't yearn to be out in a foreign country being persecuted. We yearn to give God thanks and teach our children in what we have. And right now we have a peaceful country where we still have freedoms of religion in this country. Is it one nation under God? <laughs> Far from it. But we can speak of God without fear of persecution today in this country. So as we think about the gifts of the Spirit, we're going to get into that in a couple of chapters into Acts about where the Holy Spirit comes on again in um, Samaria. If we don't have gifts of tongues and gifts of healing, my opinion, I always throw that in so you know that's from Scripture, it's not because the Holy Spirit quit giving those gifts. It's not because there's not as much of a need of those gifts. Maybe it's because I'm not as in tune with the Spirit enough. If I'm not preaching Jesus Christ in my native tongue, how would I ever expect the Holy Spirit to give me another language? Are you being a witness for Jesus Christ? That was his prayer before he left the upper room to be crucified. Merle read some of that scripture today. His prayer was for each of those that would believe, not to take them out of this world, but to protect them from the evil one because they have a mission. So I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 7, verse 51, and then carry us into 8, 4 today. Verse 51, Stephen said, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Why are they this way? He says it next. You always resist the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did. And that seems strange at first that Stephen would say that, but the Holy Spirit was there, the Holy Spirit is here now, and even more, the Holy Spirit abides in us. It is what sanctifies us through and through, which transforms us to be like Christ. So if we are not listening to the Holy Spirit, if we're not in tune with the Holy Spirit, then how can we ever expect to walk like Jesus walked in this world, which is what He told us to do? What brought him glory, which will bring us glory. And we see that. They see, we saw the heavens opened up when Stephen was stoned. <clears throat> which of the prophets did your fathers fail to persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you are his betrayers and murderers. And you will pledge your allegiance to one king or the other. It is either King Jesus or it is not. Verse 53 you have received the law, the law ordained by angels, yet you have not kept it. On hearing this, the members of the Sanhedrin were enraged, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, because he's different, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's like Christ, says it right here, he is full of the Holy Spirit. It's not something Stephen did, it's what God did in Stephen. Because he walked in step with the Spirit, then right now he is full of the Holy Spirit. To me, that's a preview of heaven. At that point, Stephen was so saturated with the Holy Spirit, he couldn't do anything earthly or worldly because it's all stamped out. Scripture tells you that, that if you do things with the Spirit, that it's, that's contrary to things of the flesh, and you won't do those evil desires. So he's full of the Holy Spirit, number one. Number two, he looked intently into heaven. Number three, he saw the glory of God. Number four, he saw Jesus, his Savior, standing at the right hand of God. Standing to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Verse 56, his reply, because he's so full of the Holy Spirit, and he sees this glory in everything. He says, look, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But there's an opposite here, it's not written. At this they covered their ears. They cried in a loud voice and rushed together at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. This is a tragedy. 
This is the, the religious continuing to persecute the church to the point now where this should shut their mouths. Get them to stop proclaiming Jesus Christ and resurrection of the dead. Because now we're going to kill someone. We might have been afraid to kill one of the twelve, but we'll kill Stephen. He's just a guy. And they kill him in rage. A tragedy meant to wipe out the church, but what does it do? It makes the church even stronger. Strong enough that they can be driven from their homes and preach the gospel wherever they go. Let's read on. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So he's going to come on the scene and we're going to see him really persecute the church. I'm going to say a but in here again that's implied. They were stoning him. Stephen appealed. Didn't stop him. It's nothing that man can do to harm me. Not even a hair on my head touched if it's not in God's will. And then, if I am killed, I get to meet Jesus face to face. <clears throat> when they were stoning him, Stephen appealed and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there. This is 8.1. I'm reading continuously. And Saul was there at that time, at that moment, giving approval to Stephen's death. And on that day, that same day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Instead of the church being destroyed, it's going to be spread in power outside of where it has already flourished amazingly. God-fearing men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. They weren't scared. They mourned. I can mourn the loss of somebody, but also know at peace that that person is in heaven because of the hope that they had. But Saul, verse 3, he began to destroy the church, going from house to house. You weren't safe in your own homes. He dragged out men and women and put them in prison. And what happened as a result? Verse 4, what a beautiful verse. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So I have to sit here and think to myself today, am I preaching the word of God wherever I go? What is it going to take? Is it going to take me being dragged out of my house by the government saying, you can't preach God anymore and I'm throwing you in jail? Is that what it's going to take for me to preach the word of God? If I'm not preaching now, I don't think I'll preach on that day. I really don't. I don't think the Spirit will fill me like it filled Stephen because I'm not letting the Spirit fill me now. Do you get that correlation? How are you living your life? We're starting out a clean slate again. This is 2022, and everybody's going to be saying this year, I don't know, I haven't looked at any headlines yet, and I don't plan on to right away, but they're probably going to be saying, is 2022 going to be as bad as... 2022 is going to be whatever it is. And God is in complete control. And you are His hands and feet in this world to tell them of His love through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus told the 12, maybe the 120, this in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you know what was written in Acts? In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, And while they were gathered together, He commanded them, and this is the, four, the twelve, maybe the hundred and twenty now, Don't leave Jerusalem. Well, we're getting forced out of Jerusalem now, right? Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father promised. Oh, well, we can be forced out now because the Holy Spirit has come in power. Which you have heard me discuss. Verse 5, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But it's hard for us to think of heavenly things, isn't it? Because we fix our eyes on earthly things instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So we don't understand this. Verse 6. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore what? The kingdom of Israel? We're working for the kingdom of heaven being restored here on earth. 
There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus is going to wipe away every tear and there's going to be no more death. Isn't that what you're living for if you have faith? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. Wait a minute, that's the same word that Jesus used back in Matthew 28 when He said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, since I have all this authority, go and make disciples. Go. The word go is a continuous go along. It doesn't mean I have to be driven from my home to go. It means as I go, everything that I do each and every day is to tell others about Jesus Christ. By the way, I live a holy set-apart life by the example that they see in me, by the joy that I have, and then if I have opportunity that I can tell them about Jesus. I can't force it down our throat, but if they see it in me, they will ask me. Right, Merle? <laughs> Even the ones that look like they're the furthest, well, I don't want to have anything to do with you, Jesus, now. I know you're a Christian. But as they see, they'll want to know a little bit about Jesus. And what's different about the hope that you have that they don't have? <clears throat> verse 7 said it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority but you have authority to go right so then verse 8 is telling again what Jesus told in Matthew 28 but you don't, have, you don't need the authority to know these things but here's what you do you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses where? in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. Don't laugh at me. I think I said utter. 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 I'll say it right. Potato, potato. <laughs> so here it is in Acts 8.1 we see Jesus bringing about Acts 1.8. Now who would have thought it would have been persecution? Persecution to the point of being driven from your homes to spread the gospel message. And would you have been ready for it? If you know, because everybody wonders about this, when are our freedoms going to be stripped in this country? If you knew they would happen July 7th, 2022, what would you do? Would you act a little differently than if you don't know? What if they were January 7th, 2022? Would there be a little more urgency still? Each and every day you have been given the gift of life, new life through Jesus Christ, to live for God and His kingdom. To teach your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors, even your enemies about God's love and compassion and His mercy and grace while they have chance to accept that. And who wants to live their life wasted? I don't think anybody will say that. And I think the older you get, the more you realize that. And the only way you're not going to waste your life is to be in step with the Spirit. Because if Stephen wasn't in step with the Spirit again, he wouldn't have become full of the Holy Spirit at that time. He would have pleaded for his life instead of begged for mercy for them. He wouldn't have been the example of Jesus Christ in this world. And we probably wouldn't read in Scripture that the heavens opened up and he saw Jesus standing there to greet him home. But we do read all this because he allowed the Holy Spirit to transform him even to the point where he didn't worry about his own life. What greater love a man has than to lay down his life for his friends. <clears throat> All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and he said... Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and in teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. There's not any other part to that. The authority of Jesus didn't say, go do this, go do that. It said, be a disciple and make disciples. And to be a disciple, what do you have to do? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. If you want to be Jesus' disciple and you don't do these things, you're not worthy of Him. It's not an easy task. It's a task that cost our Savior and our Lord His life. He didn't have a place to lay His head in this world. 
and he did it all for us. What can I do but give my life back up for the one who gave his life for me? And you see here, it wasn't the 12 that were scattered. The commission is not just for the 12. I hear so many Christians say, well, I'm not called to be a disciple. Yes, you are. <laughs> if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. You're called to go wherever God calls you to go. But if He's not calling you to go anywhere right now, then be a disciple in your neighborhood, in your family. He's not going to call you to anything greater. He's not going to give you any greater gifts if you're not being a disciple for Him now. No one can deny the call of a Christian to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that same word is translated as martyr, even unto death. The Great Commission is not a great suggestion. It's not for some. It's for every single one who calls upon the name of the Lord and is saved. Oh, now I figure out why I wrote that word occupant. <laughs> because that's the way we're supposed to live. Jesus lived as an occupant. Stephen lived as an occupant. What do I need to do to live more as an occupant in this world? Because it's the things in this world that do tie me down and cause me to stumble. And Paul tells us to get rid of all that. It's not the fact that I'm persecuted or anything else. It's the things that I have that cause me to be complacent. Oh, well, it's not really. It's myself that causes me to be complacent because I have a sinful nature I'm still struggling with because I'm not letting the Holy Spirit fill me to the point that I should. Father, forgive me. Fill me with your Spirit. Use me. Thank you for all you have given me. Blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. <clears throat> Yesterday you should have read Psalms chapter 1. If you did, it maps out the plan. There's only one way. <laughs> the righteous study and meditate on God's Word. They are like a tree planted by the rivers of water where their roots go deep and they get all the nourishment that they need. Not so with the wicked. They're like chaff instead of like that tree planted that will be blown away. <clears throat> If you haven't read uh, the, the devotion for today, Psalm chapter 2 is, Why do the nations rage? Well, let's just read it. We'll read it together as a church. So you can't say you hadn't done at least one. Look, I've got it on my phone, like I said, so that if I forget my book, i got it right here. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 4. Some of the psalms will be the whole part, the psalm some won't. It depends on the psalm. This happens to be the whole entire psalm. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. No intimidation. Each day the media highlights new things to fear. The powers that be in society tell us that obedience to God shackles us, limiting our freedom. In reality, liberation comes only through serving the one who created us. Those people and forces that appear to rule the world are all under His Lordship. And one day they will know it. God still reigns and we can take refuge in Him from all of our fears. So to be intimidated by the world, Psalm 2, is a spiritual is a spiritually fatal as being overly attracted to it, which is what Psalms 1 tells us. Prayer. Lord of the world, people resist your claims on human lives. I fear to speak of you for fear of ridicule or anger, but you are not intimidated by the world or its powers, nor should I be. Help me to know the joy of obedience and the fearlessness that goes with it. Amen. That's your devotion for today. There is a path Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And all men take one path or the other. We're going to read on a little bit and read about Philip and read, read about Simon the sorcerer. And it says he, he believed. But did he believe? And that's not going to be where our focus is when we get there because it's not up for me to judge or anything. But if I have life, I should have fruit. We'll go back to Psalm 1 there. I'll bear fruit in its season. You might see that fruit today. You might not see that fruit. But I guarantee you God is faithful, more faithful than you ever thought about being. And if you are that witness to you, your family, you will see lives saved for all eternity. So what is stopping you? 
You have no power to get them to heaven. But you have every bit of the ability to go through that process by giving it to God and praying to Him and trusting Him and being like Christ in this world. He can save them. Acts 2.42, I want to remind you what it said. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. And I remind you this again as we go into this season so that we do this as a church. Maybe they had forgotten about the Great Commission at this point. Maybe they need to be driven from their homes to realize this. I don't know any of these things. But these things continued when they were driven from their homes. Wherever they went, they preached the gospel message. That means they were continued to be devoted to the apostles' teachings, even though there wasn't an apostle there when they were driven. That means somebody like Philip had to stand up or whoever had to stand up in the church. They continued to have fellowship. They weren't afraid to gather together. And they broke bread and they prayed together, even after being driven from their lands. So what, I'll say this again, will cause us to move out of our comfort zones and be the voice, the hands and feet of Jesus in our world. From last week, I read to you, or Merle read it to you also, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. Joy? They're driven from their homes. They're jailed. One of them is killed. But as you look, they still find joy in it. Because the overall purpose of making Christ known and the possibility of those being saved along the way is so much greater that that is joyful. If I have to give up this whole world, which what does it profit me to gain the whole world and lose my own soul? But if I have to give up this whole world and then see my grandchildren, my ch children and grandchildren saved as a result, then I'll give up everything. Problem is, I won't as I continue to hold on to them as I continue to not let the Spirit dwell in me more and more, because these lusts will control me rather than the Spirit controlling my steps. So we've got to be led by the Spirit, so that when that day does come and we're driven from our homes, if it does come, that we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 of Hebrews 12 said, Consider Him... Consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's not an easy thing. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, full of joy. Remember why they did? They were stripped of their skin, the twelve, remember? Remember? They rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. And as a result, what happened? Verse 42, Every day in the temple courts and from house to house, they did not st stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Christ. Now these people that were following them have been scattered from their homes, imprisoned, beat, everything else, and they're preaching the word uh, Acts 8, 4, everywhere they went. It's a church multiplying itself, not afraid to preach the gospel message. So I have to ask, how is the church living today, especially in this country? But I'm not worried about, I am worried about the churches around us. I'm concerned about this church because God has allowed me to be a shepherd here. How are we living? So I beg with you to take, if you didn't get it. I think, did everybody get a devotional? Everybody should have joy. You have one if you don't know it yet. Okay. And if your family didn't get one of the rocks, be sure to get one. We read at, uh, Psalm 2, January 2 today. And like I said yesterday, I kept going back to it because I have it on my phone. And when I had a free minute, I went back to it, read it again. But you can read it with a copy of the Bible you have wherever. You can memorize it, the Scripture, whatever. It wouldn't be that hard to memorize th that amount. You'd have all of Psalms memorized. Wow! Well, remember the disciples? Uh, uh, well, not necessarily the disciples, but some that were trained up by the rabbis. Rabbi stuff. They knew the entire Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Wow! But hiding God's Word in your heart 
that you might not sin against Him. These psalms of praise and adoration for God in all kind of circumstances. I remember when I was growing up, I read psalms a lot as a teenager. And I remember I read, and I don't remember which number it is. One of you might can tell me what it is right off. But it kept saying, fret not yourself against evildoers. My biggest concern then in high school was the evildoers that didn't like me because I wore glasses and was smart. <laughs> so I read that psalm, I fret not myself against evildoers. And I fretted because I asked this one girl, she wanted a couple skate with me. She's like, no. <laughs> That was the biggest frets that I had. But see, God is big enough that if you're being run from your home, if you're being persecuted for your freedom, if you're in fear for your children's life, He's big enough to take control of it. He is in control of it. There is no reason for you to fret. Love Him, adore Him, praise Him, and be a witness for Jesus Christ. You are an occupant in this world. Given life given you life because God has chose to give it to you. In the Old Testament, the word yeshav means to dwell, to sit or abide as an inhabitant. It's used 1,088 times in the Old Testament. First time that it's used, it's used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. They think, Genesis 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, they get driven out 4. Huh, Cain and Abel. Okay? What's the story there? We knew, it's not told that we're supposed to, we knew that we were supposed to present offerings to God. And one person chose the right path, chose to give out of their heart, to give the best to God, and one chose not to. Psalm 1, Psalm 2. And God came to Cain and said, Why are you unhappy? Why are you doing this? All you've got to do is turn to me and take this anger and envy out of your heart. But Cain wouldn't, and where did it lead, right? Genesis chapter 4, verse 14. Behold, this day you have driven me from the face of the earth, and from your face I will be hidden. I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Not so, replied the Lord. If anyone slays Cain, then Cain will be avenged sevenfold. And the Lord placed a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled, that's the word there, dwelt as an occupant in the land of Nod, east of, Cain, east of Eden. And Cain had relations with his wife, and he conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain built a city and named it after his son Enoch. Wow, I'm, this is a totally different sermon I could spend forever here. But like I said, you know what happened? And Cain is driven out as a wanderer, and he gets a mark on him. What are you thinking about a mark? <laughs> those that were marked with the beast? Oh, and those that took the mark of Jesus? Well, you see those same things? And, and wait a minute, Enoch. Isn't that the man that we just read about in Hebrews 11 before chapter 12, whether you read it or not? By faith, Enoch? One day he just disappeared because he walked such a way with God, pleasing to God, that God just said, come home. And that was Cain's son. God is a huge God. But He wants you to lead your children, your family, your neighbors, and your friends. He doesn't need you to save anybody. But He allows you to be a part of it. Wow! Are you being your part? By faith. And because we have all these examples of faith, therefore... Fix your eyes on Jesus. No matter how you're persecuted, no matter what your troubles are, consider Him who endured the cross to save you. Psalm 1.1, you should have read it yesterday. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or set foot in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the stream of waters, yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whose, who prospers in all he does. I told you I didn't know why that word occupant was written there. It's in Psalm 1-1. Wow. 
Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or set foot in the path of sinners or yasab, dwell as an occupant in the seat of mockers. You know, I've read this psalm so many times and I've realized that it said there's a walk there, there's a stand there, and there's a sit there, depending on your translation. Involving all aspects of what we do, rising up, oh yeah, rising up and teaching my children along the way as I sit and go and everything else. And I'm supposed to go and make disciples. All this is just flooding my mind. But this sit, I never really thought about it as dwelling as an occupant. Because what happens so many times is we walk in those paths and then we stand in those paths and look and then we sit down. Maybe it's in the easy chair and we get complacent and we say, I'm not a wanderer anymore. This is my home. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that person. This is not my home. It is the place where I can live for Jesus Christ. And as Debbie picked out in one of the songs, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer lives. It is Jesus Christ who lives in me. Before Jesus prayed the prayer in 1 John, I want to read you just a few things that he talked about. That path that we're to choose. You know where John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But as we keep reading, and I'm taking selected verses, truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I am doing. Don't forget that. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the, to the Father. And don't say it's the 12 or the 120 because we've already seen common men and now we see the church being dispersed and preaching wherever they go. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. I am the true vine and my Father is the keeper of the vineyard. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Oh, now I'm thinking of Psalms 1 that I just read again. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes to make it even more fruitful. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. This call for holiness for God's people. I have told you these things so that my joy, that joy that he went to the cross and endured it, the joy that they rejoiced in that they could be counted worthy of being stripped of their skin. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love no one has than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Stephen got to see Jesus face to face and he said, not only well done, my good and faithful servant, but he said, come here, friend. Wow. Because he let the Spirit of God fill him through and through that there was no animosity, no hatred, only a concern for people to know God. John 17, that part of that prayer that Jesus said, I have given them your word you're going to have to spend time in God's Word. That's why I brought the devotionals to at least get you to touch it. We read one today. It doesn't take long. It's so easy to get distracted and not do that reading today. Next week I'll probably concentrate on prayer. We'll see though. See where God takes me. But we've got to spend time in God's Word. It is a lamp for you to give you direction and guidance. I have given them your Word and the world has hated them as a result. For they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I am not at asking that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not, for, not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We're not going to get the Spirit revealing to us and sanctifying us without the word of God being present in our lives also. As you sent me into the world... There we go. We are called to be His hands and feet. I have also sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified by the truth. It was the common person, the church as a whole, that was scattered in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 due to persecution. 
They couldn't be complacent. They couldn't do anything else. They were scattered because Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. Acts 8, 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So we have to be a church that is committed to the word so that we can be committed to the Great Commission. Meeting together, praying together, studying together, loving together, loving even our enemies. Will you commit to that? Will you commit to that with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength? Because if you don't, it's a half-hearted committal. You'll praise Him with your lips, but your heart will be far from Him. Jesus' prayer is clear in John 17. Scripture is clear. Your life is not your own. It is bought with a price. Do you realize that? Will you accept that? Will you love the one who loved you enough to die for you? There's a second word in the Old Testament that could be equated to occupant also. It's gar, pretty simple, G-A-R. It means a sojourner, a stranger, one who dwells temporarily in the land because A, they're a citizen of another country, and B, they're there in that foreign land because they have a job to do. You'll find that in Psalm 19 when we get there. I'll start in verse 17 of, of Psalm 119. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a gar, a stranger on this earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your judgment at all times. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, cursed you stray from your commandments. Remove my scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Though rulers sit and slander me, your servant meditates on your statues. Your testimonies are indeed my delight. They are my counsels. Spend time in God's Word. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? If you're not spending time in God's Word, you're not going to be like Psalms 1. You're going to be more like Psalm 2. I'm sorry. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest He be angry and you perish in your rebellion. When His wrath ignites in an instant, blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Psalm 2 goes on. I said before that it didn't. I apologize because these are from Psalm 2. It's longer. So you'll have that in day 3 or day 4. I'm not sure when you'll get to it. The Psalms were a hymn book the treasure of the people of that day. If they had any written words, like I said before, this is what they had. Rejoice and pray through the Psalms this year. Pick out a reading pattern. Spend time in prayer. Don't get out of the habit of meeting together. And remember that you're called to live for Jesus, to love one another, not just to love people in this church, not to just love people you know, not just to live neighbors in, love neighbors in proximity, but love even your enemies those that persecute you. So pray for boldness. Pray for the joy and peace that fills your hearts through Christ Jesus. Look and consider Him who faced the cross to save you. I'm going to close with a psalm, and this is from the message. Some of you like the message. Some of you don't like the message. It's modern English, but its truths are still there. It's not considered a Bible because there are so many words that are far from the original word. But I do read it sometimes as just a refreshing, and I want to close with this. Probably these are potentially words from Moses that David hid in his heart and then wrote down when he was having trouble, but we don't know for sure. But That's where the Psalms are credited. I'm determined to watch steps and tongue so they won't land me in trouble. I mean, that's as common English as you can get. I decided to hold my tongue as long as wicked was in the room. And we get some, some insight to Solomon and his wisdom here. Mum's the word, I said, and kept quiet. But the longer I kept silent, the worse it got. My insides got hotter and hotter. My thoughts boiled over. I spilled my guts. Tell me what's going on, God. How long do I have to live? Give me the bad news. 
You kept me on pretty short rations, my life. Is a string too short to be saved? Oh, we're all puffs of air. Do you hear Solomon and David's wisdom in this? Oh, we're all shadows in a campfire. Oh, we're just spit in the wind. We make our pile and then we leave it. What am I going to do in the meantime, Lord, hoping that what I'm doing, hoping you'll save me from this rebel life, save me from the contempt of idiots. I say, I'll say no more, I'll shut my mouth, since you, Lord, are behind all this. But I can't take it much longer. When you put us through the fire to purge us from our sins, our dearest idols go up in smoke. Are we also nothing but smoke? Oh God, listen to my prayer, my, to my prayer, my cry. Open your ears. Don't be callous. Just look at these tears of mine. I am a stranger here. I don't know my way. A migrant like my whole family. Give me a break. Cut me some slack before it's too late and I'm out of here. Father in heaven, May we live as temporary residents, not because our time is unknown, not because our days are short, but because you have given us the blessing of each and every day. No matter how long, no matter how short, may we live each and every day as a blessing to you. May we be a people united and sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. May we be accountable to one another. We may we even point out sins in our lives not to condemn, but to draw out that disease out of our lives so that we may be a righteous, set-apart church that brings glory and honor to you. Give us the mindset in the heart of Jesus Christ where we love others, even to the point of sacrificing, not just sacrificing, but giving up our lives to save others. Lord, I also pray a blessing upon each and every one here. I thank you for the spirit of unity that is in this church because the spirit of God dwells in this church. I thank you and praise you for the privilege of, of being here to shepherd. And I pray, Lord, that you shepherd me so that I can shepherd your people. Lord, I pray that each and every one understands here that they are part of the body of Christ and have a purpose. And without them giving their part to the body, that the body is not going to function as properly as it should. And Lord, we do thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. And we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace that you have given us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for our freedoms that we have. May we not be complacent, but may we use these freedoms to take to our advantage to tell others about you. And may we not be hypocrites, but Lord, may you examine our hearts. And if you find anything in our hearts, Lord, may it be exposed and given to you. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.